The Cornelius Church of Christ welcomes you. In this lesson, Evangelist Brian Haynes addresses the question, Are we saved by faith only? Do you understand what faith is? Is faith a work? This lesson was delivered on March 10th, 2024. Sing and be happy, count your blessings. Josh, nice songs today. I really appreciate that. Really some good stuff. Um, well, we had some really great stuff this morning and as far as our worship has gone. Uh, we had a great scripture reading. That I really, uh, really love that chapter in Psalm. Uh, but our, our talk at the table this morning particularly got to me. I, I, I picked up a piece of paper and I thought, I'm going to throw out my sermon. I just want to talk about Ezekiel 37 now because that was really pretty incredible stuff. Uh, talking about that new covenant and uh, connecting that to the Lord's Supper. I was just really, really excited about that. And I hope you really appreciated that because that was really something uh, exciting to talk about. And the things that I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about today are, are things that I think are important for us too. And they relate in a lot of ways to a lot of the things that we've already mentioned. That covenant relationship that we have with God uh, that is established through Jesus Christ is a covenant that is based on the idea of faith. And I want to spend a couple of minutes this morning talking about that. I want you to go with me over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, looking at a passage that is a, a beautiful passage, but one that I think a lot of times people get a little confused about, misunderstand a little bit. But it is a passage that speaks to, well, honestly, it speaks to that great covenant that we talked about just a moment ago, the covenant that Jesus uh, established through his blood, the covenant that the prophets of old told us in the Old Testament was coming. Ephesians chapter 2, if you'd read along with me at verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There are a lot of different ways that we might try to expound on the idea of the plan of salvation. Um, what do I mean by the plan of salvation? I guess you, if somebody said, is that the gospel? I'd have to say yes. The gospel, the covenant of Christ, the law of Christ, these are all terms that are used the same way throughout the New Testament to describe the relationship that God has offered us through Jesus Christ. You're not necessarily just in that relationship just because you exist. You're in that relationship because you consciously entered it. Okay, let me say that again because maybe sometimes I get lost on a lot of people. You are in a relationship with God because you consciously made a choice to enter it. And we oftentimes speak of that conscious choice as the idea of how it is that we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk a little more about that, of course, as we always do in just a few moments. The Book of Romans is a, a great and marvelous uh, conversation about that plan of salvation. Indeed, uh, one of the things about the Book of Romans is that it's trying to explain to us that God prepared for us a relationship by the only way that we could have a relationship with God that would be successful. In the first three chapters of the Book of Romans, the Apostle Paul goes through the, ex, the, the concept of the history of man in his relationship with God. And he begins by saying, man's history is we don't do so well when it comes to trying to relate to God. God gave us all a reason to accept he believed, or to believe that he exists. But for many people, they will choose not to believe, or more so that they will choose to just do the things that they want to do. And this is the, the problem with sin that all human beings have. Everybody struggles with sin. Paul would want us to understand in Romans 1, 2, and 3 that the Jews, uh, the people under the law of Moses struggled with this, and the Gentiles, those that were apart from the law of Moses, struggled with the problem of sin. And God's point in having these two groups was to demonstrate something. 
that having the right law wasn't the answer. Having a law that was good and wholesome and, and uh, obeyable wasn't enough because people still transgressed. Does that make sense? In other words, uh, somebody might say, well, you know, the problem here is the law is not fair. So God created a standard of a very specific law and a very generic law, the Gentiles and the Jews, and he demonstrated with those two pairings that no one, Romans 3 and verse 23, no one was able to successfully overcome. Indeed, that's the conclusion Paul reaches in those uh, poignant verses in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 23. Tell me what, I'm going to read those to you. You, uh, you can welcome to read along. As Paul was uh, concluding his great observation about these things, he says, Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, this is again Romans chapter 3, verse 19, that every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God. What does Paul mean? Paul is saying that the reason God established the law for the Jews and a very different kind of law for Gentiles was that he wanted to demonstrate it wasn't the law's fault. People sinned. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the way, that last verse, a lot of times we, maybe even I, will sometimes cite it as a statement to say everybody sins. And, and while I think it's demonstrable that everybody sins, that's actually not what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, that everybody being the Jew and the Gentile are condemned by God. The Jew with a very specific, a very good, a very clear law. The Gentile with a very abstract kind of law. There's a matter. Everybody sins. Because humans sin. So God was demonstrating to us that the only way people could be righteous was to find a way to have a righteousness that was apart from the law. And in the subsequent verses, in the next chapter, the Apostle Paul will say what that's about. And he'll use Abraham as an example in chapter 4 and verse 3 through 5. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and that was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who does works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted as righteousness. I want to pause there for a second because this is the thing I want to talk about a few minutes this morning. A righteousness that comes by faith. God has demonstrated, and this is Romans 1, 2, and 3, that a righteousness isn't going to be achieved by us if it's a righteousness just by doing the rules that God sets up because we mess up. Because whether it was very clear or very abstract, whatever it is, we fail to live according to a standard that God says. And God, understanding that ahead of time, established those ideas so that he could demonstrate to us that the only way we were going to be justified was through faith. Faith is one of the most misunderstood words that people know of today because it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And usually, for most people, it's not what the Bible says means by that. When I talk about faith, I usually like to kind of point out three important ideas about faith that the Bible wants us to have. Number one, faith is about believing God, but not just believing God or believing in the good, uh, that God exists, but believing in the goodness of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, uh, as the Hebrew writer was talking about faith, and chapter 11 is his conversation of faith, he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders, those everybody before us, he says, obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not by, made by things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. 
By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We could just camp here on this last verse because the substance of this verse is so tremendous. Faith, as he is describing it here, is the only way you will please God. Now, I, I guess I probably don't need to tell you, you want to please God, right? You want to stand in a way before God that God says, well done, good servant, faith is it. And if you don't have that right faith, and let's be clear, that's what he's talking about, a faith that believes God exists and that God rewards those who diligently seek him. You know, that word diligent gets brought up a lot, right? In fact, many times we've tried to make the point, God is not saying, I want you to perfectly seek me, I want you to, what's the word, diligently. Whenever you think of God saying, you know, what is God's command of Israel? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, all your might. That's diligence. It's every aspect. We had, a, we had an invitation recently on that very idea. And, and the point it struck to us was diligence is the only thing that, that makes faith pleasing before God. Faith believes God is good. Faith believes God is rewards those who diligently seek Him. But that's not all faith is. This is where, again, what most people define as faith departs from what God said. For the second thing God's Word has said is faith is not just the idea of, well, I believe God exists and I'm going to be diligent to drive the speed limit and thereby I'll please God and go to heaven. God says faith is actually doing what he has said. As the Apostle Paul wanders through Romans, the book of Romans, as it gives again a book about the nature of faith, one of the most important, and dare I say controversial, if people think about it, statements he will make is in chapter 10 and verse 17, where he will make that statement, most of you probably know by memory, that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You do not get faith from your church, from your parents, from your preacher. You do not get faith from walking around and looking at the sky and looking at the things around you. The true faith that pleases God can only come through hearing the Word of God. This is the Word of God, right? True faith can only come by your, by your connection to this. Lots of people say they believe in God. They have no connection to this. That's not faith. That's important to understand. The word faith and the word believe aren't the same idea. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And if that's not where your belief comes from, it's not faith. But, but, but again, even here is not where the conversation about faith ends. Because the third saying, I said there's three things that that are really important to grasp about faith. The third thing is the Bible is explicitly clear that it's not faith until you act on it. It is not faith until you act on it. In James chapter 2, James would elaborate at great, uh, at great length about the nature of faith and, and how it is that uh, the faith, and he goes to the same example that Paul uses in Romans, that of Abraham, Abraham, uh, in our men's class, we're going to be talking about Abraham this afternoon and the nature of faith. And one of the things we're going to talk about is, is how often God in the New Testament points to Abraham as all the attributes of faith we're supposed to be invested in. In James chapter 2, James uh, begins at verse 17 talking about the nature of faith. And he begins by saying, faith, if it does not have works... By the way, tie that to the last passage we talked about in Romans 10 and verse 17, works that God has stipulated. If you're not doing what it says here, you do not have faith. That's what he's saying. 
And what I've just told you, as I said, is probably one of the most controversial ideas in the religious world because almost nobody believes these three things are true. Oh, people talk about faith all the time, but what are they talking about? They'll say it's faith. You believe in God. That's good enough. They'll say it's faith. It comes from your church. It comes from something else. That's good enough. But no one will say faith is a diligent belief in God that comes because you heard the Word of God and you did what the Word of God said. That idea is something very, very few people grasp. And I want to give you an example of that this morning by uh, talking briefly about a doctrine, an idea that a lot of people have. Indeed, if you were to drive from, from church to church today, especially in the United States, you'd probably find a great many of the people there talking about an idea, an idea that they would say a man is made right before God by faith only. Sometimes the expression is by faith alone. This is not a doctrine that goes back to ancient, ancient times. It's only been in the last 500 years specifically. Most of you probably know the story of this doctrine, how it was that a Catholic monk, uh, a Catholic professor, I should say, named Martin Luther, seeing a great many of the problems of the teachings of Catholicism, challenged Catholicism, and it's counting on specifically works, not works that were in the Bible, by the way, but works that had been created by men, were defining righteousness, he, he rightly saw that that was wrong, but then determined that, that this concept of faith, a faith that could be held to you by a church, by, uh, by somebody else, that this concept couldn't be what God wanted. A teaching that works alone, and yes, that's what many people would teach if they taught that a baby could be baptized and saved. That's saying works alone. A baby doesn't have faith. A faith that was held not by us coming to an understanding of God and obeying it. Oftentimes it's demonstrated or spoken of a faith that is a church. Sometimes today, this day, people say, what is your faith? They're asking what your church is. Well, their mindset is that a church holds faith for us. It holds understanding for us. It holds a, a, a diligence that God commands of us and as individuals. It holds it for us so that it accomplishes these things for us. And Martin Luther said, well, that can't be right. Unfortunately, though, instead of saying uh, those very simple three things that we just mentioned a moment ago, he said, perhaps what we must say on the other side of this is that it is only believing that creates the relationship that God has. One description of it said that his doctrine was the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the material principle upon which all other teachings rest. And that's a great statement to say that many churches, taking a very simple idea that God merely desires for us to believe in Him, faith, just believing, and that alone is sufficient, is probably the predominant view of people in the world today. I imagine you talk to your neighbor and you say, hey, aren't you worried about what's going to happen when you die? No, I'm not. Why not? Because I believe in God. That's what they're saying. The person who thinks I'm going to heaven because I believe in God, I think I'm a reasonably good person, is saying that's why. Because they have taken on an idea, an idea that uh, uh, another person would describe the firm rock, which is called the doctrine of justification, the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine. Christian, he means Protestant, which comprehends and understands all goodness. Paul would, or, I'm sorry, uh, Martin Luther would introduce Paul's writing to the Romans, trying to change what Paul said by describing faith is God's work in us. Ironically, he introduces the book of Romans like this because you would see in the book of Romans very quickly that's not at all where Paul was going. Paul was describing the things that faith, if we have faith, faith and how it works in us by hearing the word of God, by believing it, by obeying it. Instead, though, Martin Luther determined faith was God's work in us. He said, you, you have to get God to work faith in you or you'll remain forever without faith, no matter what you wish, say, or can do, which contradicts 
what we just saw in Hebrews, where God said it's your diligence that is the measure of faith, which contradicts what Paul said in Romans 10, that you hear the word of God to obtain faith, which contradicts what the scriptures say in the book of James, which says that faith is only living and active whenever it is in obedience and action. And this is what so many people believe. Indeed, those churches that adopt, adopted this model soon after Martin Luther became known as Protestant churches, we're not one of them, right? Uh, hopefully all of you understand that. We are not a church that was uh, formed by those that protested Catholicism. Those churches that are commonly called Protestant are those churches that adopted these teachings and moved forward with a model that said faith is just acknowledging God. As I said, lots of people, even if they don't know it, they're approaching God that way. God gives you faith. Later on, uh, uh, one of the uh, Protestant teachers named John Calvin would say, God gives you faith whether you want it or not. He would say, God just doesn't give some people faith because he just doesn't like them. And that became the doctrine of Calvinism. And today, if you sit down with your neighbor and your neighbor says, I believe in God, I'm going to heaven, and you say, what do you, why would you say that? You, they would, might say, well, it's that statement that Paul told us back in Ephesians chapter 2, that you are saved by faith. For many people, when you start talking about what do you need to do to be saved, that will be a confusing question. For many people, when you start having a conversation about the things that you did to be saved, that you heard the Word of God, that you believed it, that you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you turned away from sin, you were baptized. By the way, every one of these things spoken of by Paul in the book of Romans, at length. And they would say, no, no, no. Baptism is only a sign. So let me just kind of make a couple of points here about, about a doctrine so many people you know and you love have been misled by. Point number one, there's a big problem with believing that faith alone saves you, and that is that it's not in the instrument of faith, the Word of God. It's just not there. One of the conversations I'll always have with somebody is, can you show me a passage that says that? No, they'll jump over to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, and they'll say, oh, look, here it is. And I'll say, well, that's funny, because in my translation, in your translation, every translation of the Bible, that word only isn't there. And they say, well, it should be there. Yeah, I've, I've had people say that. I've had people say, well, it's implicitly there. If it says you're saved by faith, it means only. And I'll say, well, wait a second. What about all the other things the Bible says you're saved by. When the Bible says you are saved by your endurance to the end, you will be saved. Hearing the word of God, we read this one in 11, believing the knowledge of God, repenting of our sins, calling on the name of the Lord, confessing Jesus, being baptized, remaining obedient, remaining faithful. Uh, in fact, one of the ones that kind of I laugh about is in Acts chapter, 20, Acts chapter 27, Paul says, if you stay on the boat, you'll be saved not our salvation, just their salvation on the boat. And in Acts 27, they were all on shipmates on Paul's boat with him. But the point is, if you walk through the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about salvation. And if somebody says, well, if it says you're saved by something, we can add only and be safe, you're in trouble. You've got how many different plans of salvation there? God becomes the author of confusion. You've got a big Problem because your number one problem is this is not something the Bible says. Oh, wait a second, correction, number two. Actually, the Bible does use this expression one time, right? I see a couple of you nodding already. Because in the book of James, James uses the term faith only. Some translations say faith alone. And what does he say? I've had people storm out of a study whenever we went here. Whenever I said to them, you know, I know you believe that just believing in God is going to be enough to save you, but the only time that expression, faith only, faith alone is found, is here in James chapter 2 and verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only, and they close the Bible and they leave. I just closed my Bible in the place I was, so i got to find it again. But they're done. The only time... That expression is found in the scriptures is when it says that's not how this works. 
That's not how this works. For a lot of people, they'll, they'll look at these statements and they'll say, well, wait a second. Let's go back to that passage in, in Ephesians, then chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, because he says it's not about works. And for many who, you know, like I said, they may be caught or they may, they may appreciate the idea that, okay, that expression is not found there, but he explicitly says, not of works. There's nothing you can do to be saved. And I might ask him, well, what do you think he's talking about works there? Because, you know, in the preceding verses, he was talking about circumcision. Subsequent verses, he's talking about circumcision. These are all works of the law of Moses. Wouldn't that make sense? That's what he's talking about. Well, no, works. So I'll say, well, what, what is works? Well, it depends who you ask, because some people say, well, confession, repentance, baptism, that's a, that's a work. Repentance and baptism, maybe they just, they'll, they'll say confession's okay. Some say, oh, repentance and confession's okay. Really, just about everybody will say where, where the distinction is, is baptism. One teacher put it like this. I just copied his statement about no works, and this is how he put it. He says, well, if you have to do something to receive it, that is God's salvation, it is not a free gift. Now, by the way, that's not how free gifts work. My father once offered me a magnificent free gift years ago. Uh, we, were, uh, we were kind of struggling, and he said, I'm going to get a new vehicle. I'm going to give you my old truck. That was, it, was, it was, wow, it was a great thing. He said, you got to come down and get it and re-register it and put it in your name. Well, if it's something I got to do, it's not a gift. Isn't that about the dumbest thing you've heard? If I have to do something for what he has paid for, what he has offered me freely, it ceases to be a free gift. Free means he paid for it. It was a marvelous gift. It was a gift at a time when we needed it, and it was a great help for us. And he said, yeah, you're going to have to do a few things. You'll have to register. You'll have to, you'll have to get insurance, all these different things. Of course it was a free gift. But somebody goes on to say, Romans 4.4 4 says, Now the one who works, his wages are counted as a gift, is due. Baptism's a work. Repentance and faith. This, this person thinks repentance is not a work. Repentance and faith, not a work. Baptism's a physical act, therefore it's a work. Problem number three. You know the one thing that the Bible says is a work? Is believing. In John chapter 6 and verse 29, Jesus was talking to the, to the audience there and he was talking about what it would take to be saved. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Now, what's interesting about that, in that list of things that we just talked about, there's actually not a passage that says repentance is a work. There's not a passage that says confession is a work. There's not a passage that says hearing is a work. There's not a passage that says baptism is a work. The one thing that the Bible calls a work in the New Testament is believing. That's fascinating. Here's what's, um, here's what's crazy. And it's so crazy that, and you see it in the scripture now, you understand, if someone comes to you and says, the only thing you've got to do to be saved is to believe, and I believe that you, you know, that it's, uh, that's uh, salvation by faith alone, if believing is the only thing the Bible actually is explicitly saying a work, then somebody says, I only believing saves you, they believe in works only to be saved. If they're saying, I'll put it up here again, if they're saying, just got to believe, that's ironically, the one thing the Bible has explicitly said is a work. Ironically, they believe in salvation by works alone, which is no thing at all. What was Paul's big idea with trying to get us to understand faith? And what was it that faith meant? Uh, and why, why was it such a big deal that God would say things about faith requiring you to hear John 5, 24? And most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes. Here is Jesus saying, you got to hear what I have to say. If you want to, and I'll say begin, begin the faith that saves you. Hebrews chapter 11 
is an interesting chapter where we started just a few moments ago. Hebrews chapter 11 begins an idea that says faith, no matter when it was, whether it was Abel, whether it was Enoch, whether it was Noah, whether it was Abraham, in each case, faith was somebody hearing what God said and then acting. Action. Might as well cut out that entire chapter if you don't think that that's a, a, something that God says because that's what that chapter is all about. Indeed, I would suggest to you that if we take the proper setting of what we read just a moment ago, Ephesians chapter 2 is no different. Look what he says here. Let's go back to it again. I'm going to cut out for the space. Uh, we read it before, so hopefully uh, you, you appreciate what I just took out some things for space. Even when we were dead in trespasses, we were made alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves give to God. You get the idea. This is the one thought, right? You, you understand that. But there's something I want you to grab there right in the middle of that one thought. And I'm going to guess probably a lot of you have already grabbed it. It's, it's this word right here. Raised us up together. Raised us up together. You know one marvelous thing about the Bible? The Bible never says things just once. Uh, I've often said, you want to understand the Bible, you're going to have to go to those parallel passages. Well, the book of Ephesians has an entire book that's parallel to it. It's the book of Colossians. And the parallel of this passage of Ephesians 2 is Colossians 2, verse 12, where the buried and raised up is baptism. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him. Ephesians 2, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, through faith. Through faith. And the Apostle Paul was telling the, Col the Ephesians or the Colossians or the Romans, you guys have been saved through faith. What we want to appreciate and understand is that he was talking about a faith that was demonstrated and ultimately activated when someone was baptized. Now, a moment ago, you saw somebody was trying to say oh, baptism is a work and therefore it can't be a part of that process of salvation. But you know, there's a funny passage about baptism in Titus chapter 3, where Paul says, our salvation, uh, verse 4, he was talking about our salvation. He says, it's not by works, okay? Well, that kind of clicks in. He says, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. That sounds a lot like you've been saved by grace through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You probably picked up it's a reference to baptism. It's the same thing Acts 2 and verse 38 says, that if you're baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works when you're baptized. Washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. You know what this passage just said? It just explicitly said baptism is not your work. Baptism is God's work. Now that kind of makes sense if you think about it because... When it comes to what am I doing to be saved, well, right now, you're, you're sitting in a, in, a, in a seat and you're listening. It's you doing that work. You could get up and leave. You could, you could put a finger in your ear. You could get on your phone. But you're making a choice to listen. Does it make sense? I hear the Word of God. I hear the Gospel. I believe. We just explicitly saw it. God said, that's a work. But it makes sense because I'm making a choice. Do I believe Romans chapter 10 and verse 17? Do I believe James chapter 2 and verse 26? Do I believe Titus chapter 3 and verse 5? I make a choice. Do I believe it or not? That's my work. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Romans 10 and verse 9. I repent. Meaning I make a commitment to change. But what's so marvelous about that word baptism is I don't say... I baptize, but I say I am baptized. Even, even in our language, Greek language, but our language as well, we're acknowledging I'm not doing it. 
Instead, it is being done to me. Now, we've said this all the time. When somebody gets baptized, the church isn't doing the work in that moment. No, we love to see somebody get baptized. We even have a place that people can get baptized, but we're not doing it. The person baptizing, we've said this many times, doesn't matter who baptizes you, because the person baptizing is not conveying some specific authority that they're given. No, the Bible never says that, and, and we, for a lot of reasons, that obviously can't be true. Somebody's doing work in that moment. Who is it? If it's not the person baptizing, if it's not the church, who is it? The Bible says it's God. Baptism is the work of God. You go out, you talk to your neighbors, and you talk about what it is to have faith. They probably don't get it. They probably think that just believing in God will be enough. And that's a terrible, terrible, terrible deception. The truth is, the Bible establishes for us a concept of a plan about saving faith. A plan that says that when we hear and believe the Word of God and we confess that Jesus is Lord because we heard the believe, I want to be clear to say we're building on things, and I repent, I change because I believe that I am then baptized, baptized. And the Bible says that as I am raised up out of that water, it is God that transforms me, that raises me with Christ in a new life. From dead to alive, that's the moment of my great change. That faithful life that I have from then on is meant to be a testimony of my commitment. If I don't have it, then I, then I don't have it, you might say. But if I believe that I am saved by faith alone, something the Bible doesn't say, if I believe that I am saved by works alone, something the Bible very, very much stands against, then I am just alone. I don't have any hope. Would you take a second? Let's go to our Father in a word of prayer this morning. Would you join me? Most holy God and Father in heaven, we're so very grateful for the many blessings you give us each and every day. Father, in this day, we've had a few minutes to break the bread of life, your word. And we understand this morning, Father, how important it is that faith comes from hearing your word. Faith is knowing that you are good and that you reward those who diligently seek you. And Father, faith requires us to act on what we have heard. And Father, we can appreciate this morning that without these things working together, we do not have a confidence that we have approached you the way we ought to approach you. Father, we pray earnestly you might help us to consider these things. Uh, Father, if we have an understanding of these things, that we might be equipped to share it with others. Father, that we might consider how in our lives we are constantly working out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing your word and being diligent in our pursuit of it. Father, bless us in this new week. Be with those who are sick, who are, who are struggling, who are suffering. Have mercy on us, Father, and in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I suppose there's probably nothing more that I can add than just to go back to what we said just a moment ago about, about what saving faith is all about. James, James would say, you know, there's kinds of faith that aren't saving. He would say that devils believe in God. He says, and they're, they're, they're shocked by it, but uh, they, 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 they fear God. But that's not going to save them. I hope this morning you've heard the things that are going to save you in submission to God by faith. Paul said it wasn't enough that there was just good rules for us to follow, and God proved that by setting up two different kinds of law for the first half of humanity's story and demonstrating that whether it was a very good and perfect law that described everything or whether it was a very abstract law, either way, mankind didn't do it right, that it needed a justification by faith, and he gives us that idea how. But faith is not just believing, it's doing. And so that's the thing you're left with this morning. What are you going to do? Every time we come together, we offer an opportunity. Uh, and we say, if you have something you'd like to talk about afterwards, we'd love to talk to you about it. If there's something you, you think you need to do afterwards, uh, we'd love to hear, hear about that. We'd love to talk to you about what the Bible says. Maybe you just need to learn some more. We get that. We understand that. We'd like to be a part of that conversation. Maybe, though, you've heard enough and you say, I know what I need to do. Well, then the opportunity is yours.
If there's something you'd like to talk about, you're more than welcome to come up here and visit with me while we stand and we sing a song to encourage you. Thank you for joining the Church of Christ in Cornelius, Oregon. We can be found on our website. You can scan the QR code on your screen or the CD you were given or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cornelius Church of Christ. Thank you and God bless.